Hello students, it's Dr. Yu. Welcome to part three of resume writing, particularly good resume writing. We're gonna talk about formats, headers, summaries, and key proficiencies. So now we're getting into the actual writing part, the moment that I'm sure some of you have been waiting for is the actual writing. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna deal with a couple of things relating to formatting as well as writing in this lecture. So first we're going to ask what are the three resume formats because there are three formats that have different strategic implications for what you're going to highlight and low light in your resume. But then we're also going to look at sectional formats too and those have a visual layout implication as well for your reader. Then we're going to talk about resume speak because that's something that you have to be able to do properly for it to sound like a resume. And then we'll talk about headers and making sure that you have a good header. We'll talk about summary sections and we'll do a whole thing on how to write a good summary section and then also key proficiency. So if you haven't written a resume before, or if it's been 30 years since you've been on a resume, like you probably haven't heard of a key proficiency section. So modern resumes have these now and we'll talk about that. So got a lot to do. Let's get to it. First, let's talk about the three resume formats. Now, what I want to say first is when we're talking about the resume format, we're talking about the format of the resume as a whole. So this is me on my mouse trackpad trying to draw a circle. Okay, so we're talking about the whole document, three different formats for the whole document in terms of the layout. So first you have chronological format. When you do a chronological format resume, what you're going to do is you're going to emphasize work history. When we say emphasize, so this is really important. You'll hear me say a lot, you need to sell this, or you need to sell that, or you need to highlight this and low light that. Remember the principle, you are what you emphasize. So when I say you need to sell your work history, what we're saying is when you look at the one page document of a resume, selling means putting most of your oomph behind, putting most of your emphasis behind. In this case, in a chronological resume, this person is really selling their work history because look, look how much space it takes up, number one. But then number two, the highlighting of accomplishments and putting a lot of oomph here really emphasizes that this is the key thing that I want you to take away from my resume is the fact that I have this great work history behind me that looks really awesome and you can see accomplishments behind it. And even like the first statement in the summary is highlighting work history and everything else just revolves around it. So when you do a chronological format resume, you're putting most of your space, you're putting most of your oomph, your, bas your, your basic argument is your work history. And it's gonna be reflected in how much real estate and time and space you put in. So think of it this way too. When you give a speech, you're limited by time, right? So if you have a speech and you have five minutes, okay, you have five minutes to talk about X. In writing, you're limited by space. Typically resumes, especially for new college graduates, are going to be one page. If you're limited by space, then you gotta use your space efficiently. You gotta be space efficient. And you have to make sure you're putting the right amount of space to your strongest points and less amount of space to your weakest points. Because it's kind of like you give a speech and you talk about your weaknesses for four minutes and then your strengths in the last minute. Like that's, people are just gonna remember your weaknesses. In a, in a paper or in a resume, if you just talk about your work history and that's your strongest thing for the majority of the document, so 75% of the document, that's probably what I'm gonna take away from your document is stuff from your work history. So when would you use chronological format? You would use this when you have relevant experience. So if you're, if you're just, I'm, I've been in accounting for 10 years and I'm just applying for an accounting executive two position, cool, I just need to run a chronological format resume, show my work history, highlight my accomplishments, talk about them in the summary, and just let my work history really stand out, good to go, I have relevant experience. Yeah, totally do chronological format there. But also, if you just have an impressive work history overall. So even if you might be transitioning to a different function or maybe to a different industry, it still might be useful to have a chronological resume because you can say that everywhere I go, I'm successful. So even though I haven't worked in this industry in particular, you can make the argument through your work history that every time you have worked somewhere, good things have happened. Like you, we've, we've gotten better sales or we've gotten more donations or whatever it is that your industry does. So the thing is, chronological resumes are usually the most preferred by recruiters as well, because I'm gonna show you two other formats. 
but the third format could work too. So I don't want to confuse people. But yeah, the 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 thing about the chronological format resonate is it's very straightforward, very easy, and this is where you're going to put your emphasis. So what else is there besides chronological format? There's this other format called functional format. Now in a functional format resume, what you're going to do is you're going to highlight and put more emphasis on skills and abilities, and you're going to low light work experience. So notice here in this document, how much space, if we start here, is to summary and key skills, and how much less space is given towards work history. And then when you look at work history, it's very minimal information. It's just the job title, the company, the location and the years for every job. So compare that to the chronological resume where we had like half the document, like remember it was like, like this chunk, all work history. Here, work history is just this little tiny chunk because what I wanna emphasize are the key skills that I have or maybe the education if he wanted to do more with that. But here, he really wants to emphasize these skills that really can't, wouldn't be easily evident by just looking through the jobs. Because if you look, he's been a production assistant, a store clerk, a warehouse associate, a driver, a grant writer, a utility worker. So I mean, like, this guy's been all over the place. What would I take from that, from a work history? Make it clearer with a key skills section. So when do you use functional formats? You use a functional resume when you have a problematic work history. So your work history is not something you really want to sell. When would you have a problematic work history? Well, if you've been a job, <clears throat> if you've been a job hopper, so job hopping is like you hold a job for three months and then you quit and then you move on to the next thing, three months quit. You know, you just don't hold a job very long. The other time is if you have a serious gap in your work history. So let's just say something happened and you have a really bad gap and you don't want people to see it, then you could potentially use a functional resume for that. So there are times when you want to do that. Or if you just literally have no relevant experience. And the only way you think you can make it evident to the employer that you have the skills that they need to, success, to succeed at the job, then a functional format might be your best option. The thing is, functional format resumes have trade-offs because a lot of times ATS systems may not read them very well. And then sometimes recruiters are like, functional resume, you know, and they just don't like them. So there's trade-offs. They can work, don't get me wrong, but you just there are some trade-offs to using them. And then this third format is what we call combination format. Now the combination format tries to balance all sections or at least do a little bit of what the functional resume does with that key skills section and making it big and being heavy on summary as well, but still also putting a lot of oomph into work experience. So you can see here, there's description and then a lot of accomplishment as well. So this person's really trying to sell everything when it comes to their work experience and their skills and their summary. So this is actually the most recommended format among resume writers. So if I'm writing a resume for somebody, I'm looking to do combination format if I can, because I like to balance everything out. But there's been times where I've done chronological format resumes just because you know the person just straightforwardly fits the thing. And so there's just, it just made more sense to do that. I've done a few functional resumes too. And so I try to do those very sparingly. Now, you'll use this when you're strong in all areas. Like you're a very talented candidate or the position requires a lot of skills and experience and it's just like a high level position. You're probably gonna have a combination format resume. Or if you're applying for a technical job, you're definitely gonna need to have this section if you're applying. Like IT people, you need to have this section for sure. So technical jobs will need to have something like a combination resume. Now, the trade-off to a, so why doesn't everybody do a combination resume? The problem with the combination resume is they're long. This resume that I did here is two pages. So this would not be something viable for everyone if you're trying to stay to a page. So you have to figure out, should I be more than one page? And the real rule of thumb there is years of experience that you have. You know, a lot of people say 10 years. If you have more than 10 years of experience, you can go over a page. It's really about space efficiency at the end of the day. Uh, at the end of the day, how much experience you have, what are you emphasizing, and what are you selling? More and more, people have two-page resumes, but not typically college graduates, though. College graduates should probably be one page because you're gonna have less than five years experience. But if you're mid-career, late career, you know, there's more, more room there. Now, 
let's talk about the three sectional formats for your resume. When we're talking about sectional formats, what we're talking about is within each section of a resume, what kind of formats can you use? So before we were talking about resume formats, we were talking about the whole shebang. Now we're talking about within each section, what should format should you use? Now there are three sectional formats that you can have in a resume. The first is paragraph format. So literally you just write out in a paragraph what it is that you want to say. So here you have a whole paragraph, you know, accomplished registered nurse, 15 year record, successfully anticipating patient needs and ensuring full recoveries, proficient evidence-based care and emergency response, praised by hospital for interpersonal skills and consistent abilities to build trusting relationships with patients. Okay, so notice it's in a paragraph. It's just like as if you were writing an essay and so forth. This contrasts with bullet point format. So we take that same text and instead we put it in a, in a bullet point form. So now each sentence has its own bullet point. And then you can see with the bullet point, it's, it's easier to speed read at least in that, in that case. Now the thing about bullet point format compared to paragraph is paragraph format's gonna be more space efficient, but bullet point format will take up less space, but it'll be easier to read. And then thirdly, you have mixed format. When you use mixed format, you do a little bit of paragraph and you do a little bit of bullet point. How you typically organize it is your paragraph part is gonna be your least important stuff. It's gonna be the stuff that's like descriptive, stuff that's not super important because most of the time when people read, they'll read the first sentence and then they'll go straight to the bullet points. But then the bullet points are gonna be the things you wanna highlight. Those are gonna be the things that when the person speed reads, they're gonna read like maybe a little bit of this and they're gonna start reading this. So then I want my accomplishments to be bullet pointed. I want the things to be highlighted. I want the things that I want the reader to really notice to stand out with the bullet point. So mixed format, you paragraph the unimportant stuff and you bullet point the important stuff. And then you make sure those bullet points really stand out. So in this case, she has an accomplishment here with praise by hospital for interpersonal skills and consistent abilities to build trusting relationships. Oh, I forgot ships. Okay, anyways, I'll fix that slide later. All right, but there is that. So here's a comparison of how this might look. You have paragraph, you have bullet point, and you have combination. So it just depends on your situation and what you want to highlight and what you want to low light in terms of which format is best to use in each section. Now, the other thing you have to know how to do before we can really start writing is you have to know resume speak. Resume speak is the convention by which we write, by which resumes are supposed to sound. And it's not just arbitrary, like that it just is this way. It's because resumes are supposed to be efficiently read and sped read. And so you wanna write your resume in a way that eliminates wordiness and makes it easy to speed read for the reader. Because business writing as a whole is supposed to be efficient. It's supposed to be very easy to, to get to the point because people are busy and it's not like liberal arts writing where like, yeah, you're supposed to explore and use creative imagery and all this stuff. Business writing is like the opposite. It's very task oriented. It's very to the point and you have to know how to sound professional in a resume. So you have to remember your resume is an audition. It's an audition for a job. It's an audition of your writing skills. It's your audition to sound professional. So what are some conventions of resume speak? The first thing and the first rule of resume writing, you never use I in a resume ever. Why? Because your name is already at the top of the resume. So everything is already assumed to be about you. You wouldn't write a resume for someone else with somebody else's name at the top, right? So when you have your name at the top of the resume, everything is presumed to be about you. So you don't need to use I. You also don't need to use any first person at all. You don't need to use I, you don't need to use me, you don't need to use my, because everything is presumed to be yours. So anytime you, you are writing a resume, eliminate I, me, and my. The big thing with resume speak is you use action verbs, adverbs, and adjectives to begin sentences. So because you eliminate the subject, your, your sentences will start with action verbs, so verbs like helped or you know solved or increased, those kinds of things. You can use an adverb. So remember an adverb says how a verb was done. Speedily increased 
Sales profit margins by 50%. Okay, so speedily is an adverb. That's perfectly fine. Adjectives can also begin sentences. You can say passionate salesperson, blah, blah. I don't know I'm on sales right now, but yes. So passionate is an adjective. Okay, yeah, you can totally begin a sentence that way. What you don't start a sentence with is I. Okay. And then you're going to use something called telegraphic writing. So in resume speak, you don't use the articles a and the. It's called telegraphic writing. You eliminate those because once again, you're eliminating wordiness and you're making it quick to speed read, easy to speed read. And then as far as tense goes, when you're talking about past jobs, you're going to use past tense. So we'll have a whole section on work history later in the series, but we'll talk about what that looks like. And then present tense for current jobs or for current things. Now, when you do present tense, you you don't use the the uh, es. You just use the verb. So we'll we'll talk about that when we go to work history. I don't want to get ahead of myself. And then you try to use numerals for numbers wherever you can, just because writing out the word is less efficient than just seeing the number. And then whenever you show a, a series of things on a resume, whether it's your education or your work history or community service awards one. You show things in reverse chronological order. What that means is you show the most recent first and you work backwards in time. You don't start with the oldest. You don't start with the job you had 10 years ago and then work up to the present. You start with the, you start with the present and then you work backwards. So the first job should be your most recent job. The second job should be your second most recent. Same with awards, same with education, same with everything else. So in your education section, shouldn't be your high school, then your college. It should be your college, then your high school. If you even need to list your high school, which that's a whole other thing. Okay. So that's resume speak. Let's practice. Let's practice this. So here are five sentences that are currently not in resume speak. What I want you to do, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to watch you. Something well, I'm not really watching you, but I'm going to watch the camera, watch you. And I want you to rewrite these sentences and resume speak because we got to make sure you understand this because I know when people don't watch the video lectures because they mess up resume speak really badly. So this is how I know if you've been watching or not. Okay. So go ahead and take a couple minutes, pause the video if you need to rewrite these and resume speak based on the principles I just taught you in the previous slide. I feel like I need some Jeopardy music. That'd be good if I had Jeopardy music and while you did this. Anyway. Okay. So pause the video if you still need time. If not, let's go over the answers. Now, I should say that the answers will vary a little bit because you can reword these in so many ways, but I just want to make sure at least you got the principles of what not to do. Okay. So that's, that's the goal here. What not to do. So for number one, if we compare, so you have, I updated the social media postings, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter for the company. So you want to drop the I and you want to rephrase the sentence, updated company, social media postings on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter made it a little bit more efficient anyway. And I didn't use, I dropped the I. And I dropped the articles. So updated company, social media postings on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Okay. Then what about, I was in charge of a team of four customer assistants. Okay. Just say led team of four customer assistants. And you can even just say led four customer assistants if you want to be super efficient, but I might want to have team in there just to say it was a team. Okay. Then I have two years experience solving problems with customers. Okay. Solve customer problems for past two years. And if you want, you could still put two as a number as well. So you could do that. So if you want, and then my current position is training the new hires in the stores, policies, and procedures. How about train new hires in store policies and procedures? So get rid of my, get rid of the, and it's still in present tense. My current position involves selling used cars to first time customers and making sure they're happy with their purchase. Okay. That's good. How about this? Sell used cars to first time customers and ensure their satisfaction. 
So the present tense here, notice it's not selling used cars and it's not even sells used cars. It's just sell. So that's what I mean by present tense without the S. You just use the verb without any S or ING. You just use the verb. Now, if it's in past tense, then you would just put sold used cars. If this is like a past job that you had. Okay. So as long as you upheld the principles, you're okay as on this. So if you re, if you reword it a little bit differently, that's fine, but just make sure it was in resume speak. That's the critical thing. And your resume needs to be in resume speak the entire thing. Now we're on to headers. So this is the first part of your resume. We have all this theory now and abstract stuff. Now the rubber's going to hit the road for the rest of this series. How do you write a header? Okay. So the header is going to be the top part of your resume. So we're just talking about everything up until the summary here. So this is the very top. The first thing that people are going to see is your name and your header. So we want to make sure that these are really good. Now here's a really bad header. Here's why this header is bad. Number one has information it doesn't need. I'm going to talk about the information it doesn't need, but number two, look how many lines this takes up. This takes up six, seven, seven and a half lines, probably just on header alone. So if you're going for a one page resume and seven of your lines are just the header, just your name and address, that's way inefficient. Now here's the thing about headers. Headers aren't going to win you the job. Okay. Like nobody's going to go like, Oh, his email is this hire him. You know, like nobody's going to do that. No, the, the header is just so they know who to contact and they know who the resume is from. That's all they need to know from the header. So you don't want to put all your space and all your real estate on a header because the header is such a small part of the resume. But if you, a lot of people, I see this get really flashy with the header and they end up using like 10 lines just on the header. It's like, no, no, it should be efficient. Be small, be short to the point because the real selling points are in the summary, the education, the experience, all the other sections are what going to sell, are what going to sell you. Okay. So this is a bad header. Don't do this. Don't do this. When you do a header, here's what you want to do. First off, you don't want it to be more than two to four lines and four. And even, I even hesitate saying four, like I really say three, but like I can see, I can see some, there's actually one format where it can actually look okay with four, I guess, but that's it. I mean, three is really my, my max. Here's what you include your name. Of course, you got to have your name on your resume. Like I've seen it before. People don't have their name on their resume. When I worked at the nonprofit, cause we had to hire some people sometimes. And like, somebody didn't have a name on the resume. Like we like the guy, but we just, or the girl, I don't know. We don't even know who it was, but we don't know who they are. So we don't know who they are. All you need on your header is just your city, state, and zip code. You do not need your street address. Okay. You do not need your street address. So I haven't clapped in a while. So there you go. You don't need your street address. They're not going to mail you anything. It's going to be with your application anyway. All they care about is city, state, and zip code because the only thing the employer really needs to know on the resume is just, do you need to relocate? That's all they really care about with city, state, and zip code. Are you within driving distance within this place? Because if you need to relocate, then they have to offer a relocation package and maybe they're okay with that. Maybe not, but they need to know either way. Your cell phone. So a lot of people put like home phone, office phone, fax, no, 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 just your cell phone. Why? Because you want the phone that goes directly to you. When you have five phone numbers, it's like, which one do I call? Which one's going to be the one that goes to you? Just get the, give us the one that you answer. So the cell phone. So, because you don't want to take chances with your home phone, because like, if you have family, if you have kids, anything like that, employer calls and like, you're not home and then your kid answers and like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll call him back. And then like a week later, your kid finally remembers, oh, this company called you. Like, yeah, you don't want to do that. Just give them your cell phone. Keep it simple. Keep it easy. The number goes directly to you. It goes directly to your voicemail. Make sure your voicemail inbox is set up by the way. I, I mean like look, younger generation people don't have voicemail inboxes. It's like if I'm an employer and you miss my call cause you don't answer cause you only answer texts anyways. And I can't leave you a voicemail. I'm kind of locked out from contacting you. I guess I could email you, but that takes time. I was hoping to make calls today. See, now you're messing up my timeline. I'll just move on to the next person. You see? So make sure you have voicemail set up, make sure it's professional by all means, make sure it's professional. I've seen people like pre like download recorded voicemail things from YouTube that are really funny, but then as an employer, you're just like, that's not attractive. Okay. So cell phone, make sure you have voicemail. And then of course your email because some employers, so employers vary. Some employers might call you 
and just offer you an interview right there on the spot or call you and say, hey, can we set up an interview? Some will email you. Some will give you some kind of email notification. They'll say, hey, we, we, we want to move forward with your application. Write us back with an email, blah, blah, blah. So you got to make sure you have your email. And then optionally, you can also have your LinkedIn on your resume. In fact, I recommend it more and more now to have your LinkedIn because your LinkedIn makes you more. See, here's the thing. Resumes make you very two-dimensional because everything's black and white and it's just like text and documents and all that. But LinkedIn is like a portfolio page where you can have multimedia, you can you can interact with people, you can have endorsements, you can have all these beautiful things that you can't put on a resume. So I like I want people to go to my LinkedIn. So when we talk about LinkedIn, remember that LinkedIn is something to not hide. It's not your Instagram, it's not your Facebook, it is something you want people to go to. I hope they go to my LinkedIn. I hope you look me up on LinkedIn right now. Like I hope you go there right now. I hope you're opening up a page. I hope you're not doing anything else, but you're going on LinkedIn and you're finding me on LinkedIn. Like I hope you go there, okay? So that's what we want to be with LinkedIn. So here are some different header ideas that I think are efficient. So you can do like a two liner here and just have the name. And then like, this is what you kind of saw before. If you want to do something like this, this is done with the table. So you do a table and you just do two columns. So it kind of looks like this. And then you just do left align here and then right align here and then just put the name at the top. And that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. Or if you even want to do like a one line header, Notice how everything here fits on one line, just right there, boom. So you have options, but the key thing is you gotta be efficient with the header. And you still want your name nice and big, so don't, don't be shy about your name. Make it big, make it so people know who you are, but then make sure you get the critical information, city and state, email and phone number. Those would be the three most essential, four things right here. One, two, three, four. Make sure you get those four things in there. And that's it, no street address. I don't need your Twitter handle unless you're doing social media management. I don't need anything else from you. Now, let's get to the summary section. The summary section, as we go through this resume here, we have our header here, and then we have our summary section here. And we're gonna talk about particularly this part. Now, we'll also talk about this part too. Oops. The first thing about summary sections, and I don't know, people take resume writing from like their high school English teacher, their junior year, and it's, you know, it's fine, but there's things that have changed, okay? So this is one of the things that has changed. Let's just do a little experiment here, if you will. Tell me which one is more persuasive. Exhibit one. Or exhibit two. Okay, which one of these makes you go, I really wanna hire this person? Exhibit A or exhibit B? I can guarantee you, people wanna hire exhibit B. Exhibit A tells me absolutely nothing, okay? Exhibit A doesn't convey any value, it just tells me what you want. Exhibit B tells me the value you add to my company. Exhibit B tells me something I don't know about you. When you apply for a job, it's implied that it's your objective to get it. So why would you waste real estate on telling me the most obvious thing in all of human history? <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what, the, what to compare it to, but it's like the most obvious thing ever, okay? I don't know why people spend time writing an objective that doesn't do anything. It does nothing. What you wanna do in a summary section is you wanna summarize what are the key takeaways? You're selling points. Oh, yay, yay, selling points. Yeah, oh, selling points came back. Oh, yay, okay. If I don't read anything else in the resume, the summary section should be the place that tells me everything I need to know about why you should be hired. Objective doesn't do that. Objective doesn't tell me anything. So don't waste time with an objective. Just have a summary. Now, in defense of the objective, but I need to know the objective because the employer needs to be sure that I am really thinking about them and that I'm targeted to their job. Okay, so if you're really worried about that, if you just think, your resume is not, like your resume is gonna cause confusion about what your job target is. I have a solution for you, okay? You ready for this solution? There you go. What you do is you write the summary section and instead of calling it summary, just put the job target there. Solved. 
you already now you're doing the pro, the work of the objective because you're basically putting the job target. And if you want, if you want to be hardcore, you could put security specialist at and then put company if you want. So we got that. Then we get those keywords in there, and then I still have my summary. I still have my selling points at the front. I still have them at the beginning, and I'm not wasting time and I'm not wasting space with the obvious thing that anybody would that would just be super obvious when you apply for a job. Resumes just don't end up in an ATS like randomly. They don't become self-conscious robots that wake up one day and like I'm gonna start applying for jobs randomly. Okay, no, no, nothing like that. They end up there because you put it there. Okay, so just don't waste time with an objective. If you're gonna do anything like it, just put that there and then have your summary. We're gonna write summary sections. All resumes in my class are gonna have summary sections, no objective sections. Thank you. That's Moses speaking. Okay, now. Here's your activity. Gather your selling points. So remember from the last lecture, we talked about your selling points. So hopefully you have those now. Then cater them to the job target. So what I mean by cater them to the job target, you should have a job target in mind as you write this. Go through the job target, match your selling points to the job target. What would, of the five selling points that I've prepared, which ones match most closely to the job target that would make me look the best? And how can I incorporate keywords, key values of the employer into those selling points? Then what you're going to do is rewrite them in resume speak. So you got to take your selling points, cater them to the job target, and then rewrite them in resume speak. So we just did resume speak a, a couple seconds ago later or earlier. And then you want to format them into one of the three sectional forms. So either in paragraph in bullet point or in combination format. So I'll do it one more time. Take your selling points, cater them, rewrite them in resume speak and format them. Now, this isn't something you're gonna be able to do in five minutes, maybe even 10 minutes, but at least give you a minute or two to get a head start. Okay, you probably won't have the whole section done in the time that I gave you, but at least you should be thinking about what my selling points are and getting them in resume speak. And hopefully your selling points have already been catered to the job target because you know what you want to do. And then you can always format them later. Let's look at some examples though. So here's a sample summary from a resume that I did a while back. You're going to see here, we're very, we're very efficient with the header. And this person got a job, by the way, like m multiple job offers. It was great. And then we're going to put the job target here. Now notice that the job target, really the job target is just account manager, but we want to have like a little branding here. So we're going to be like top grossing because this dude was awesome at sales, like just completely killing the competition. It was awesome. So we want to highlight that. So we put this here, so that way we get the keywords in for the job target, and then also, you know right away you're getting, a, you're getting a high level competitor here. And then you see the summary section here. Now all of this is the summary section. You notice here that we have a good lead sentence. So one of the things that you wanna make sure you do anytime you write a section in a resume is you wanna have a strong lead sentence. A lead sentence is the first sentence of the paragraph. In journalism, they always talk about this. You gotta have a good lead sentence to your story so the reader will wanna keep reading. A good lead sentence and a summary is gonna be a strong sentence that says it all in one sentence why you're awesome. So the success formulas that I taught you are good lead sentences to use. And then he just goes through a little bit more like politely direct relationships with clients and you know, just all these cool things. And we even worked a quote into there. Like every, every time you do it, do it better than last time. Okay, cool. That was just the first part. Now, when you get really experienced, like some of you are like college kids, you probably won't have this part yet. You can then start doing career highlight sections. So this is like a combination format summary. 
Then you have highlights for your of your accomplishments overall in your summary section. So these career highlights summarize all of his accomplishments in total throughout his career. So he has his general summary about his selling points, and then he has a summary of all of his accomplishments in his summary as well. So then he gets like double like the point across, okay? And then everything stands out and he sounds impressive and he was impressive and just loved working for the guy. It was great. Okay, so there's that. Here are some other summary sections though. That was like too like high level, even something like this. So you have a summary section that's in paragraph format, you know, friendly and creative personality, offering diverse talents, committed to using personal communication, artistic teamwork. This person didn't have as much experience. She, she was fresh out of high school. Like she wouldn't go to college. And then, you know, passionate about serving people and others. Okay, cool. At least she says who she is and, and you know, what, she's, what she cares about. Cool. And then here you have a bullet point format summary. And here he, he starts off with like kind of like a keyword dump of branding things, branding statements. And then there you go. It has four bullet points that basically say what he does. Start with a hard, start with a hard skill, 10 years success, you know, wins new clients. This person got a job, by the way, recognized by management, you know, and then just all these cool little things in the summary. So your summary should look something like these. I mean, if you have something from the previous person, like the previous person's great, but I mean, this is what we should be aim shooting for. Notice also that these set, these are full sentences. It's not two word sentences, like go with people. You know, like that's it. Like, okay, remember, headline plus story. So you're good with people. How or what? What's a story? What's the evidence for how you're good with people? Write that down, put that in your summary section. Now there's another section you're going to add, and sometimes this gets integrated into the summary section, and sometimes it's put into its own section. So sometimes it's it just depends. So we're just gonna treat it like as if it's own section, even though it doesn't have to be. So notice here, we're going back to that other resume from the beginning. You have the, the header and then you have the summary. Now you have the key skills section. And so the key skills, key proficiencies, core competencies, it goes by several different names, but that's the section we're, we're gonna focus on here. So when you do key skills, what you're going to do is you're gonna take hard skills that you have and list them out for a couple of reasons. Number one, to help the employer know what it is that you're exactly good at quickly. So one way you can do that is through a table. Like you can literally make a table in your resume and then you can do it by category. So sometimes I do that to help the, the reader out. And then you just write the, the skills that you have under this table. And see what you should do is go to the job posting and match the skills from the job posting into this table. So if they don't call it business development, if they call it business growth, then change business development to business growth. And just adjust your key proficiency section based on what's in the job posting, based on the skills that you have. So don't make, this is a job posting, I don't have the skills so I put in there. Well, no, no, you shouldn't lie on a resume. So, but all the skills that you do have, all the things that you think you're good at, put that in here in the resume into a table. That's one option is put it into a table. But you definitely gotta have, the IT people, you definitely, you better have this in here. Like you, I, I don't see an IT person getting a job without this stuff, okay? But everybody should have it. Everybody should have it. Here are some other ways you can do it though. You can have like, you can just have like a title areas of expertise and then just list a few across. The key thing is you're gonna list across. I don't really wanna see you list vertically because for example, if you were to list this vertically, this would take one, two, three, four, five lines just for a couple words, which that's not good use of space. I mean, if you're if you're thicker on keyword dumps, I mean, think how many lines this would take if each of these had their own line. So I don't recommend doing two column format in resumes for ATS reasons. So your best bet is either use a table or list across. And then you can insert little bullet points here to make it so that it's spacious. A lot of times people just use commas. The only thing about commas is just then it looks really crowded. So I like to add little points here and put a space between each point so it's very easy to read the each of the each of the skills because you want this to be readable. I know you're trying to just get past the ATS by trying to get these by doing these keyword dumps, but still they can be incredibly useful to a recruiter or to an HR person because they say right away what you claim to be good at. And then that is a good indicator for them to then continue reading your resume to see how you're good at those things. So definitely have this, definitely have this. So 
when you practice key proficiencies, and so you'll do this on your own, I won't, I won't wait for you to do this. What you wanna do is you wanna inventory your key hard skills and soft skills. Hopefully you've already done that from the first lecture series on the job market and such. So, or the second, excuse me. And you should be able to have already done that. And then you're gonna identify the key skills from the job posting. So do a keyword analysis, use one of the three methods that I taught you and identify the key skills. And then list those key skills that match both sources onto your resume. So use a table or list across, but either way, everybody's gotta have this section for sure. So I won't wait for you to, to do that. So here's what a sample summary looks like overall. So we have the, the header, the, uh, some, the, the objective, because we have the, the job title of what they're going for. We have the summary and you can see they have career highlights just as much too. So they went that route, which was cool. And then, key proficiencies actually gets integrated underneath the objective title. You see that? So then it doesn't look like just a keyword dump. It looks like branding. So that's another way you could do it. You could have like a little title here that says kind of what your job target is. And then underneath it, claim your skills, key proficiencies that way and list them across underneath. Totally do that. Do it that way too. So that's another way you can do it. Another way you can do it as well. So here's like a, just a more basic looking resume is yeah, just have the summary here. See in her header, she put a branding statement underneath. You have office management and human resources because it wasn't, it wasn't clear. Cause actually, yeah, it wasn't clear exactly what she wanted to be. So we had to kind of add that branding statement. So it's in her header and then she calls this summary and then she does a bullet point format summary and then just key proficiencies with commas because she wanted to fit in a lot of stuff. And for some reason we didn't use a table. I don't know why we didn't use a table for some reason, but we did it that way. It's fine. She got a job. So it doesn't matter. So, okay. But yes, you see all the parts now, how they work together and you have everything coming, coming like that. So this is what you want to shoot for when you're putting your resume together, all these parts, you want to be strategic. You want to be efficient with space. Now the summary section shouldn't be more than a fourth of your resume. Cause you want to leave a lot of room for work experience, education, and all the additional sections that you want to add, but you definitely want to have this. You, and you definitely want a summary generally because sometimes it recruiters, like some recruiters say they don't read summaries. They just go straight to work experience, but some do. And so part of what resume writing is about is anticipating all possible scenarios, being ready for everything. So if somebody doesn't read the summary section, fine, they just go straight to work experience. But if somebody does and it's not there, that's going to give them pause. Having a summary section doesn't give people pause, not having one can though. So don't take that risk. Okay. So in review, we looked at three resume formats. We looked at chronological, functional, and combination. We looked at sectional formats, paragraph, bullet point, and mixed. We looked at resume speak and all the principles regarding that, how to write a good header. How do you write a summary section? Basically take your selling points and put them in resume speak and format them. And then how do you write a key proficiency section? And what does that look like? So take the keyword analysis that you learned from the previous lecture and apply that to your resume and put it in a table or list it across. Once you have all that, you'll have the first quarter of your resume done, which is really nice. And then we'll get into the meat of a resume, probably one of the most important parts of the resume, the work experience section. So we'll do that next in part four.